Um, first of all, I just want to welcome everyone. I hope everyone is enjoying the conference. I feel like I've got some big shoes to fill after coming up after Neil. Um, I hope everybody got to see that. It was a it was a great presentation. You might get a couple chuckles. I actually um, adopted a little bit of it as a theme in this, so uh, keep your eyes open for that. Uh, my name is Dan Phillips. I'm a product analyst at the Cobalt Group. And today, hello, come on in, yeah. Today I'm going to talk to you about how you can develop Tableau dashboards that can easily be consumed by the most technologically challenged people in your, edu in your organization. And I just want to emphasize that I'm talking about technologically challenged, okay? So this presentation isn't about supporting our finance groups, our engineering groups. You know, these are all data savvy people. Instead, we're going to be focusing on customer services. And for us, it's the most challenging and diverse group in our organization. And just to kind of make things even a little bit more interesting, this huge monumental task fell on the shoulders of a single analyst. And I'm not talking about Match.com single, a single person here, okay? And lucky or unlucky, to play the way, you know, depending on how you look at it, that person was me for a while. So kind of sharing some experience from the front lines here, all right? So um, I'm only gonna, um, I know your time is valuable, so I just want to spend um, a couple minutes go over what we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to spend you know, a brief amount of time just talking about Cobalt, you know, who we are, some of our partners and our products. Uh, and then we're going to spend a couple minutes and go into um, just kind of elaborate on the challenges we're facing as an organization. And finally, I want to spend uh, the majority of our time kind of diving into some dashboards. And hopefully, you guys can walk out of here with just a couple hints, uh, a couple tricks you can use that will make deploying dashboards to a large organization a lot smoother. And hopefully, your email box doesn't light up after it. Okay. So, <clears throat> all right, here we go. So Cobalt, if you didn't know this, actually started just a few blocks away on Pike's, Pike Place Market. So if you've watched through Pike Place Market, you walked through our first office. It was a one, just, just a single room, okay? And it was back in 1995. And if you guys think back to 1995, you know, Seattle was actually pretty high. You know, we were pretty good. Well, that's a terrible analogy. We were good on the, uh, <laughs> you know, we were, we were on the top of the map here. I mean, we, we were bringing coffee to the forefront, grunge, flannel, and I don't see any here, but I mean, we were even inventing sandals and socks, you know, together. You know, so we, you know, we were right on top of it. So, but when you wanted to buy a car in 1995, your options were pretty limited, okay? You basically could go into the classifieds, maybe hop on AutoTrader, all newsprint, and if you were lucky, you might actually be able to get on a website and do some research. So Cobalt surveyed this landscape, and we realized there was an opportunity. So we set up our company with a simple goal, to revolutionize the way people buy and sell cars, okay? So first, we wanted to bridge together our manufacturers and our dealers. This is kind of the core concept of our company. So as the internet expanded during that time, dealers would just basically join up with mom and pop website um, providers. And so every dealer in, you know, in the US for a network was different, okay? So to solve this, Cobalt developed a business model that allowed manufacturers to align messaging across all their dealerships. So now if you try to compare vehicles, for example, at Seattle Chevrolet and Portland Chevrolet, you're going to have the same look and feel when you go to both sites. That just wasn't happening in 95, okay? So next, by developing this single platform, we were able to um, man you know, allow our manufacturers to manage their entire network in basically a single click. So now if they have content and they want to roll that out to all of our dealerships, a couple clicks of the button, 10,000 websites updated. Okay, so pretty powerful stuff if you're trying to promote a brand throughout your company. Okay, and finally, we firmly believe that data science sells cars. So at Cobalt, we're not trying to focus on just historical reporting. We're tr oh, good, I thought that was my mic. I'm sorry. Um, um, just the air conditioning. So, um, yeah, we're not focusing on historical only. You know, we're trying to use predictive analytics, advanced algorithms. You know, we're, we're really trying to advance our, our core products in different ways from just looking back behind us. Okay, so when I mean big data at Cobalt, I mean big data. We actually have the largest automotive data warehouse in the world, okay? We bring in 20 million visitors per month. So every click, every widget response, every inventory event that hits all these dealer sites, we're recording it, okay? On top of that, we have an entire advertising network. 
And we're bringing in over a billion impressions per month into our network. Okay? So there's a lot of stuff as an analyst. There's a lot of challenges you've got to go through just to even get to, get to the data. Okay? Now, briefly, kind of a quick highlight of just some of our uh, clients and partners. You can see some, big, some of the big uh, auto manufacturers there. Uh, to highlight a couple, uh, Lexus was actually our first manufacturer that came on. That was in 1996. And uh, they kind of got the ball rolling for us. And our largest client, uh, GM, you know, they're, they're the largest automotive factor, um, maker in the world. Uh, they joined us in 2004, and they've completely endorsed all of our Cobalt solutions. So that's great news. Okay? Um, core products and services. So, like I said in the beginning, we just simply started as a website company, and we've grown to manage over 10,000 at this point in time. But as the landscapes have, have kind of evolved, we've grown into a full-service marketing agency as well. So we now offer solutions in digital advertising, SEO search, email, reputation management, social, and we tie all that together with groups that focus on reporting and analytics, and finally, our customer services department. Okay. All right, so we've got this you know, large organization, and we kind of divide it up into groups, or what we used to, we used the term centers of excellence. Okay. So each COE has a specific set of goals and products to kind of enhance our relationship with our customers. Okay. So first, you know, I'm really simplifying this here, but first we've got the engineers. Okay. They're out there you know, building platforms, designing software. All right. Then we kind of move into BI. So that's where I sit and a couple other people in this room do. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, hopefully we're gathering all this data and trying to share it with everyone. Okay. Sales and marketing, they're spreading the word about how great we are. Product, you know, they're, just, they've got, they're the idea people. So out there coming out and you know, telling us what to do. And finally, our services organization. All right. So it might seem a little bit odd that I chose to represent services as some stormtroopers. Now, I just want you to know it's not from you know, potentially the PTSD I suffered from serving this group for so long. But it was the best analogy. You know, and these are my you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson references here, you know, <laughs> my space. But um, it's the best analogy I could come up with just to kind of demonstrate kind of the size of the organization. Okay. So, Although, um, so although they're the largest group, they're the most often overlooked. Okay? So our BI, our engineering teams, our product teams, our marketing teams, they're off, they're making money, right? They're off developing products. And a lot of times that you know, your internal organizations, those are the, you know, nobody's got enough time for them. Okay? So without all that bandwidth, you know, if you needed reporting, so if this group needs reporting, your best bet is, to be honest with you, is to walk up with a six-pack to your favorite BI rep and just try to bribe them. You know, can, I, you know, can you write a custom SQL query for me? Because that was the only way to do it at that point. Okay? So that's kind of, in a nutshell, our challenge and kind of why we're here. Okay? So we want to know, you know how can we provide our customer services organization with enhanced data access when there are limited to no resources available? So let's go into just a little bit more, more detail on what that challenge is. So like I said, our, our organization is big. You know, we've got about 550 plus people. And they support all of our core products. Okay? So the, kind of the hierarchy of that gets kind of, kind of crazy. We've got offices all over the US. Oh, no, that's exaggerating. We've got a few offices all over the US, um, multiple time zones. And we embrace a home sharing program. So anytime you want to try to set up meetings or do training, it's just a logistical nightmare. Okay? So <clears throat> our, it's kind of broken out into some tiers. So our largest tier is our advocates and our specialists. I'm going to say that this accounts for probably you know, 400 or so of that group or more. Okay? These are the folks that are on the front lines every day. They're on the phone with our dealerships and supporting all of our products. So to kind of add more to the mix, we've got our managers, right? And there's always way too many managers, right? But if you've got managers, why not senior managers? Because they always want something different, right? And of course, they need your directors. And finally, you know, we've got our VPs. Okay, so we've got our, you know, we've got our VPs and our customer services group. And they're, you know, they're setting the strategy of everything and you know, um, making sure that the troops are lined up. Okay? So we've got all these multiple stakeholders. And like I said earlier, they're very technologically diverse. Okay? So we've got some automotive professionals that come into our organization, and they are sharp. They can... They understand a dealership's needs. They help them sell cars. But they don't even know how to sort an Excel spreadsheet. Like, really, 
struggling technically. All right? And then we've got fresh college grads who are actually trying to train on how to help our dealerships progress, but they can't get enough data. Right? You know, they came right off the floor of the conference here and just go, you know, I'm stifled. I need more room. So we've got this wide breadth of, of um, consumers of this information, so we really have to find a way to, on how to deliver it. And so we're going to kind of talk about some tricks on that. All right. So that group is big. There's a lot of different layers. So they've got a huge backlog, too. So how do we kind of boil that down? Well, if I showed you that backlog, it would probably look something like this. It literally stretches off into infinity. Okay. So you got to kind of figure out, is it an organization? And I'm not going to go into that here, but everybody kind of knows how to prioritize their backlogs. And it's something you've got to make sure you, you communicate with that group and really work with them to, just because you know that you're, you're this single person. There's only so much you can do. So it's not your role to prioritize. You've got to you know, embrace the organization and make sure that they do that. Okay. Now, oops, skipped one. Uh, oops, sorry. So we've got um, multiple data sources to deal with as well. Now, does anybody here have to deal with that right now? Um, I'm sure most people are in the room. So I kind of listed um, the core multiple, the data sources that are customer services organization references. Okay, We've got much more than this throughout Cobalt, but these are kind of the big dogs here. Okay, So all of our product, um, all of our website, all of our performance data lies in Greenplum. SQL Server 2012, or some kind of an Oracle, Oracle database. Right? Now, all of our sales and customer information and you know, everything that the, 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 the teams log for customer service, that all lives in Salesforce. Okay? So we've got these, these different worlds. So the average, the average workbook we're building is two to four data sources. Now, does anybody, I'm just interested, has anybody got that topped here? You know, is anybody pulling in more than two or three? Or is that kind of standard? No, oh, we got it. We got it. Oh, okay. Um, I was going to bring a six pack. I, I think you probably you know, need it more, more than anyone. So, my sympathies. <laughs> so, um, so that's you know, those are one of the challenges. And as we, as we do that, we're always trying to, you know, when we boil down that backlog. I'm sorry, a little over here. But one of the hard parts is what I was talking about is combining those data sources. Okay. So, we chose to use the, you know, unfortunate medium of Excel initially. And, you know, Everybody's nodding their heads. We all know that that's painful. Okay, so when you do that, just refreshing an Excel port report is painful in general. So we were setting up stored procedures, ODBC connections, pivot tables, and that's just a recipe for disaster, right? So everybody kind of knows that, and it's just the second you try to publish a report like that to 500 people, your email box just lights up. Doesn't work. Don't understand it. Can't use it. Okay, so that was an issue. It's unstable. Right? So um, different versions of Excel, you know, that suddenly became an issue with our organization. Um, one pivot table would render in one way and another. You know, all right, this is awful. And finally, um, something I think that's talked, spoken about a lot in this conference is um, just multiple interpretations of the KPIs. Excuse me. So if you've, got, <clears throat> if you've got a group of analysts that are all writing custom SQL, and they're all hiding it in the back end of Excel, nobody knows how you got the numbers. <clears throat> so you get all these people in a meeting, and you waste 20 minutes of your meeting because everyone's got their sales figures, and none of them match. Right? So that's like one of the issues that you know, these are some of the challenges we're trying to overcome here. OK, and finally, what I was talking about is just our resource constraints. All right, so who's in charge of all this? Who gets stuck um, with this? So it's the analysts. <laughs> all right? Who are the analysts in the room? Can I get a show of hands? OK, we got some, got some analysts in here. So you guys are behind the scenes. And I'm assuming that every other hand that didn't go up, you guys are the ones telling the analysts what to do. OK, so <clears throat> you're pretty used to listening to just some of the issues I was describing here. You know, we're all constantly complaining about how, how challenging things are. OK, so I used R2D2 as an analyst because he's basically, you know, analysts are basically the Swiss Army knives and the duct tape of your organization, right? They're the people that can take all these data sources mismatch them together, try to do something to at least make the customers appreciate what's going on. Okay? Now, as we know, though, that even though the analysts can do that, they can use that duct tape, they can use that Swiss Army knife, the solutions are just, they're just not that great. So Cobalt, luckily for us, they decided to invest, and I think you guys are starting to know what's coming, as they decided to invest in Tableau. Okay? So if we took my 
droid, you know, R two D two self, you know, I'm not quite a Jedi, but we kind of tried to get into Jedi's here. Okay, so you know, there's there are better ways to do this. Okay, and that's kind of the heart the heart of this. All right, so so this kind of brings us to the fun part of the presentation. So as I say that, I'm going to uh, kind of run over here and fun. We I mean we've got all be geeks if I'm saying this is fun. So um, I'm hoping you guys are. Uh, remotely entertained at this point and finding this uh, useful. Okay. We're all up here. All right, great. So, um, so the majority of you know, the presentations at this conference, <clears throat> they're designed for power users and consumers. All right? These are folks that they understand data and they often have the luxury of working with individual analysts to kind of design custom solutions. All right? But what if your users number in the hundreds or even the thousands and you don't have that opportunity to go out on a personal basis and either train them or gather their requirements, okay? So, I mean, what do you, I mean, what do, you do? Do you design a dashboard and just email it? Hope for the best, right? So a lot of people do that and it's kind of just bound for failure, right? And we've, um, to be honest with you, that's, that's what we started doing. And just the, the feedback was not as positive as, as we wanted, okay? So I'm trying to, we're gonna try to share some tips and tricks to hopefully make that experience a little bit better um, and also, I'll talk about a, a couple things we've set up in Tableau Server that just make life a little bit easier, and also um, just some training methodology that we've gone with. Okay. So, effectively use your resources. <clears throat> you got 500 plus people in a customer services organization. Use them. Okay. So find out who your data rock stars are. You know, <clears throat> skills are all over the place. Recruit those people, welcome them in, make them comfortable, sit in this couch, please, you know, help me out here, right? So get all those people in the room and just gather as much insight from them. What are their needs? What are their concerns? Okay, they're gonna help you build your dashboards, right? <clears throat> On top of that though, is don't forget your testers. So the testers I'm kind of just referring to as, these are the people that can't sort a spreadsheet, okay? These are the people that need to consume the data, but they're not Excel jockeys. All right, so we've kind of, I learned through the hard way is that initially I brought in all these subject matter experts <clears throat> and we, I, you know, we started building these dashboards and they were just, to be honest, they just, and I'll show you an example here, I might as well just uh, go right to it. They, were, they were looked like um, pivot tables, okay? If you own Tableau and this is what your output looks like, you're doing something wrong. Yeah, okay, it's, you, you're missing the complete point. Like you've got a couple filters, great. You can auto refresh it. You can, there's some stability in the server, but if that's what your end product's looking like, you're, we're kind of missing the boat here, all right? So <clears throat> I get all this feedback, and I realized that these, you know, these, po these, these folks that were really into data, this is what they wanted to see, though, right? And so I was like, all right, that's what you want. You know, that's what you get, you know. When, you're, when, you, when you got a list of things to do, you just want to knock it off, right? So we basically almost sent one of these things out, and I said, you know, Maybe we should get a little more feedback here from some other people. All right. So all this thing was trying to do was just figure out your spend here. So the numbers along the top were just the days of the week, right? And you can see that you know spend month to date and the percentage. All these people wanted to do was just figure out am I over or under spending my my advertising budget throughout the month, right? So we had to set something up that every day you opened it, you know, you're kind of like your mark would change. So in a sense, it's um. It's kind of like what we wanted to do is a bullet chart, but instead of a manual parameter, it would just update itself. Okay, so we moved in, and it kind of evolved into something that looks like this, which is a lot different. Now this isn't that, that fancy, but it, it was amazingly effective at getting the point across. Okay, if you were in blue, you were underspending. Gray, it's cut classic Stephen Few, right? Gray, if you don't need to worry about it, don't highlight it, right? Yeah, don't bring these bright colors up. And then if you were in kind of an orange or a red, you were spending too fast. So if you wanted to get some more information on that, you, know, you would just kind of click on an action. You could scroll through and figure out what's going on. Okay? Not rocket science here. But when I actually first did this, see that little click on a web ID for details? I didn't have that in there. Everyone is like, what's all this other stuff? It's blank. I must have had 25 emails that said your dashboard's <laughs> broken. Okay? So, Little things like that, and I'm, I'm gonna keep hammering this. And like I said, this is design 101, right? I'm not gonna be giving you all these great Jedi tricks right now. This is just 
designing for the lowest common denominator. So I'm hoping that some people can walk out of here and just go, you know, that kind of ma that makes sense. You know, maybe I should just add that. It, I, I guarantee you, if you look at almost every dashboard in the rest of this conference, there won't be instructions on it. Okay. Now, a lot of the data is perfect. It's clean. You know, I, I think all of us go home and go, God, I wish my data looked like that. It's just good looking data, right? But in reality, none of us have that, right? So the instructions are really important. So I'm going to kind of keep moving along here. Okay, so here's a kind of a, you know, kind of the heart of it is, um, you know, just some tips we can use to limit the number of questions you're going to get back when you're publishing a dashboard. Okay, so I was kind of highlighting on explicit instructions. Okay, another one is like really make sure you utilize your real estate on the dashboard. So if you're going to include instructions, and let's say it has five steps, six steps, you've just taken up probably 30% of your dashboard when they open it. Right, that scares some people. All right, so you got I've got, we got some tricks around that. Um, Clearly defining our KPIs, utilizing kind of a data dictionary concept. Um, use pictures. Use sources from outside of Tableau. When you go into the Tableau text editor, they're plain Jane. I mean, they don't even have bullet points, if I'm mistaken, right? Um, you can't do a lot in there. So a lot of times we'll actually build things in, in uh, PowerPoint and then cut and paste those images. Just anything to spice it up, spice it up make it a little bit more interesting, okay? Like I was talking before, don't assume Tableau actions are intuitive. So I've got a couple more examples of that. And finally, um, watch your tool tips. Okay? Um, easy things to forget. So I'll just go through a couple of examples here. <clears throat> so this one's got a lot going on. And I admit, it's kind of ugly, but it was extremely effective for the audience. right? So we all don't have these beautiful little public dashboards, but you know, this kind of had a few things going on. So one of the things I realized is that <clears throat> Space was at a premium for this, okay? And so we came up with this little concept here of using kind of a hover over icon. So has anybody, anybody done this trick? You got one? So I'm not at least I'm teaching some people something, so I apologize for that. But this is just a really easy trick to save a ton of space, okay? So one of the things you'll notice, and it took me like a quick second to figure out, and I'll, I'll show you guys how to do this if you're interested as I kind of keep an eye on the time here. But, um, this is an image right here, you know, these logos. No hovering, nothing's happening. It wasn't because I turned the tooltip off, it's just not a feature in Tableau, right? <clears throat> the only way to get this is to actually put this into a table, right? Does anybody want to see that real quick? I could do it? Okay, yeah, it, this should only take a second. So let me just hit, hit escape and go to um, that dashboard and We'll go to this sheet. Okay, so you'll see that I've got this little information I, right? And if you know, as you go into your shapes, there's no I there. Does everybody know how to put shapes into their, their dashboards? We've got some people nodding their heads. But as you go into, uh, let me just uh, surf over here. As you go into my Tableau repository, okay, there's an area called shapes. And you'll see that these correspond to all your drop-down menus, right? So I chose to put it in KPI. I mean, you can put it anywhere you want. But you can see I've got a little information icon right here. It's just a quick PNG file. So now when we, um, when we head back and I go to Shapes and I go into KPIs. Oops, sorry, wrong one. I'm losing my mind here. Um, there we go. And that's why I'm losing my mind. More shapes. And now under KPI, you can see I've got my information icons. So I can replace any basic data number with that. And that's my icon. And then from there, I mean, I think everybody knows how to do that. Then you basically can just go into your um, tooltip and just write whatever you want. Okay. So hopefully just, if this was worth any of your time, yeah, hopefully that just one little thing right there. Okay. So let me, um, let me get back here. Oh no, I'm gonna have some resolution uh, navigation issues. Give me one sec. Uh, sorry about that, you guys. Okay, and back into presentation. Okay, great. So a couple other things we did here as well is um, using that imagery. So it was kind of funny when we first started this, we didn't wanna share a lot of this information with our dealers. Because all of a sudden, we, 
you were able to kind of print out that this is your book of business, or this is a re this is all the dealers in your region, right? These are you know our our customers. They they only get to see their own data, right? And all of a sudden, Tableau is easy to PDF these reports, and now we can you know literally share an entire region of dealerships. So we got to be a little bit careful on that. So in our training, we would hammer and hammer that home, but I realized that just typing in "please don't share data," not so effective, right? It's amazing how much more effective just five minutes in PowerPoint and cutting and pasting an images in there, okay? So just really simple things to do. If you don't, like, if, um, if you don't want your data shared, just go and like, literally put a big stop sign or something in there, and it, people will see it, and they'll read it. So draw attention to the things you want in your dashboard. And finally, the, um, the last updated, does anybody use that in their dashboards? A couple people? Yeah, okay. Um, I realized that nobody, at, you know, Tableau server says your data was last refreshed, but most users, they don't, they don't think about that at all, right? They're not looking at Tableau Server. They've got the links saved, and they're going right into the dashboard. So what always happens is, hey, Dan, when was the data last refreshed? Something doesn't look right, right? If you put it pretty blatantly obvious and says this is when it was last done, there it is. Okay, easy trick. You can do that in a title. Everybody, does everybody know how to do that? Okay, okay, I'm not going to go through that. Good. Um, yeah, so you can go through the title on that. Okay, these are a couple quick examples of just how we tried to use um, separate tabs in Tableau dashboard, uh, I'm sorry, in uh, Tableau server. So instead of trying to cram all this information on the actual uh, dashboard itself, we just set up a separate tab that could go through and say, hey, what is a bounce rate? You have the definition, talk about it. In a sense, have like a little one page marketing white paper. Just have that be in a separate tab and just paste it into a dashboard that formats. It's a great tool. Especially if you've got an organization, oh, unfortunately like ours, where there's a lot of churn rate, right? So you don't have the ability to go talk about this every three months with all the new people that come on. Put this in there, make sure the managers know it, and they can always point to it. This is why we have this dashboard, okay? Here's another example of this. Um, we put this one in um, more for the, uh, kind of the, kind of the nerds in our org. So what we were trying to do is prioritize our accounts, and we actually kind of used a um, exponential kind of decay model, which kind of melts most people's brains, mine, mine, mine as well. So I realized that I'd actually had to go in and document this whole thing and type it all up. And I was kind of asking myself, why don't I just basically cut and paste this and keep it in the dashboard as a separate tab, right? Those really inquisitive people that, that want to know, how did you actually prioritize my accounts you know, for organic search? And it, you know, it's a pretty complicated pro I mean, it's probably 250 lines of SQL, you know, 300 lines of SQL to do that. And but we tried to simplify it in one page, and they can go through and then hopefully answer their own questions. Like, how, you know, how is the score applied? What's the short-term score mean? What's the long-term score mean? So these are things like most people have already done this work. Don't be afraid to utilize it in your dashboards, okay? Don't let it go to waste, I guess is kind of the, the story on that. Okay, so emphasizing actions. So in that first dashboard, I kind of you know, stated, you know, I actually had to write, click on this spot, right? So I did that here, and I actually had to get to the point here where I had to bold it and underline it. I mean, it was shocking that people were still missing it, okay? Because one, one of the beauties of, the, of, of just this view, and it's pretty simple, was that it actually would link back to Salesforce, right? So we'd use our URL actions, but a, an action is completely useless if people aren't comfortable clicking around and exploring their data, okay? So... Our VPN isn't up, but I could literally click this for any of our account, and it would go straight into our Salesforce system. They could look at what's been going on in the account, why is it prioritized, if it's not. And then there was actually a summary report for our managers where they could go through and say, because these people would have 200 accounts they got to deal with every month. Okay? And people would go through and do it alphabetically. Some people would do it alphabetically. Some people would do it reverse alphabetically. Some people would put Plinko chips down the line. Right? It could have, they, there was no rhyme or reason. So management just said, hey, we want you to find the 15 accounts that are struggling the most, and we just want to make sure those get done in the first few days. So there's an easy kind of a subset view of this that says manager can look and say, oh, we're 80% complete as of this on our priority accounts. Okay, pretty easy stuff. But as the end user, managers get it, but as the end users, you've got to be really clear, click on this. Okay. Let's kind of keep moving forward. Quick example on tooltips is the easiest thing to forget when you're doing Tableau dashboards. Okay? So when you go through and review your own, um, I'm just going to keep this moving because I know it'll disappear. Um, you can see the top one. This is the classic like forgetting to clean up your dimension tables. 
So like in our warehouse, it's cal underscore date, right? And then we've got all the, all the fields on that. Just not for, you know, just change it to month if that's what it is. You know, it's, just, these are just simple things, right? The other one is if you use parameters, I'm, sh I'm sure you guys have set up parameters to select on your KPIs, right? Um, and you'll just kind of name your parameter, select parameter, or, you know, just something internal. But if you don't think about it, that's what shows up on your sheet. So it's a selected KPI, right? But you can actually take that parameter in your tooltip and bring it over to say, don't tell me what the name of the, the selection filter is. Tell me what I actually selected, right? So now you can just make sure it's, they know it's visits, you know, or whatever it is. Easy stuff, but they're, the, they're just the things at the very end, yeah, that are, are good, good cleanup, and yeah. Anyway, not trying to be a nag. <laughs> Okay, so um, another, th uh, another quick little trick is just sorting in Tableau Server um, is not very intuitive. Um, I feel like I'm pretty good with data, but sorting in Tableau Server drives me batshit. It, it just, it doesn't, it's not intuitive. If you didn't know to actually go hover up over that heading, you would never know you could sort it, right? Just things like that. So if you actually put out a view that's more of a grid, you know, kind of a boring view, but it's important to sort it, there are ways that you can kind of enhance that. So you can actually do a, um, a pretty cool little parameter sorting trick. Um, so instead of as this got published, okay. sorry, it's not displaying well, you guys. This is a, um, I'm gonna hit escape real quick. I just noticed that. Oh well, it is what it is. Tableau storyboards. OK, uh, I apologize. I shouldn't have uh, left where I was. Example, 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 tooltips. Here we go. All right. So um, anyway, so emphasizing the uh, kind of some of the functionality for sorting. Oh, there we go. All right. So that's just kind of a little glitch in there. MacBooks. Um, so instead of having to go in and be um, just, just have the knowledge to go in and use that sort filter in, in server, build it straight in your dashboard, right? So this was the, the feedback we got on this was just so much more positive that, hey, this is, it's blatant, it's a filter. I sort ascending or descending, okay? Pretty easy to do. I'm gonna kind of keep an eye on my time here. So I can, we can kind of look at it later if we want to, if you guys are interested in how to do that. Simple stuff, just a parameter trick on the back end, okay? Has anybody done that? A couple people? Yeah, it's, um, it's effective with your audience, okay? Um, another hint, um, test against less than perfect data scenarios. I mean, this is pretty obvious, um, but you wanna make sure when you're, when you're building dashboards for customer services, especially the floor, where they need to go, where the, there's potentially um, 550 different stories, right? There's a different story out there for everyone. So you don't have the luxury to go into storyboards and craft what this person's book of business can do. So you gotta be a little bit more flexible on that. Um, one thing to do is don't get kind of hung up on um, how you might present data. So this is a, just a kind of a, eh, I mean, I'm mean, even aired a poor example. But, you know, under kind of like a Stephen Few methodology, he, he could say that, yeah, these red and green bars, this is enough, you know, you know what you need to click on, you know what you don't. All these extra percentages over here, don't need them. They're just, you know, cluttering up the space, right? But that's for John. If Jane comes through and clicks, this is what she sees. Dan, my dashboard's broken, right? Here comes the email. There's nothing on there, right? But there actually is, because this is the classic year-over-year -year snafu, where there wasn't a customer, or they, they weren't fully ramped up when they're doing that year-over-year that -year snapshot, and all of a sudden you've got a 3,000% you know, left, and everything else is normal around 20 or 30, okay? So, even though you would think initially, so my, my initial um, uh, view on that was, I don't need all those percentages. They're just kind of you know, messing everything up. Make sure you keep testing. Look for those off the wall scenarios because if, you're, if there's 500 people doing this, they're gonna find that little flaw, all right? Uh, another one here is um, some people wanna kind of shape the data the, the, the way they want to. So we set something up here where you know, everybody kind of likes like an, an ax, dual axis chart where they can kind of see, you know, for like on this one, impressions are on our y-axis and VIN views are on our right, and then 
we had you know, some conversion data here. And, but some people wanted to look at it differently. When I, when I started to interview, they go, well, you know, I want to look at impressions over visits, or I want to look at clicks over whatever. So you can kind of set up with some quick parameters and actually change your access. So now if you wanted to say, instead of impressions, you can do clicks, and now you can start to look for your outliers. Okay? So it allows people to be a lot more flexible with their data, um, which is great. And that's kind of what you want them to do. And then once they click on any of their outliers, here's their info. Right? Some quick spark lines, you know, some simple stuff that we all kind of read in our books. All right? Just flowing off here. So the, uh, who gets the PDF question? Can I PDF my dashboard, please? So I think we, uh, we, we've all gotten it. So just try to get ahead of the game. Right? You're either going to disable it right, or you're going to get the question. So you need a, um, it's better just to have an immediate response. You know? No, you can't PDF. We're not sharing that data. Or, hey, I've already set it up this way. Right? So just make sure you're ready for it. So we kind of set our dashboards. We try to at about 750 by 1,000 okay, for our pixels. It's, um, I feel if I go 850 by 11, um, 8.5 by 11, it just, it, for some reason the PDF doesn't work very well, so I kind of bring it in a little bit, and it's always consistent. Um, and also what we do is um, if people, unfortunately, and it defeats the whole purpose of Tableau, um, but if people do feel like they have to PDF it, make sure you're designing it so the PDF will be effective, right? So if you have these huge scroll bars or you're relying on hover overs, you know, you can't get in the PDF, right? So maybe you even have two views, right? Maybe there's more of an interactive view and then this is the view we print, okay? So just another way that like as we design things, we try to do that, all right? Um, anything that we're going to PDF, we have a separate tab because um, you know, you've got as many tabs as you want in server, in a sense. We always have a tab that, that basically has the PDF instructions. These are snapshots right off Tableau.com. Okay? Super easy to put in, saves you questions, how do I do it? Okay? The next thing is, is, if you have the type of view, and let's say the entire right or section of your dashboard is full of filters and parameters and all these different selections people can make, well, if you actually PDF that, it looks kind of like garbage, right? If you're, if you, if, like for us, if, if this is a report for General Motors, okay, General Motors doesn't want to see their name checked and all of our other dealerships there, right? So it's actually pretty easy to hide that, is you can set up a separate tab. Now, this is a total train wreck because this is something nobody would see, but to the people that use this, they can go through and select exactly who and what they want to do, highlight with a couple actions, okay, and then when they get to the actual um, kind of PDF view we set up, it's perfect. All those filters are on the back end on a separate tab. Because remember, these people don't have access to desktop, right? We've got, I think our org has 70, 50 to 100 maybe desktop licenses, somewhere around there. And, uh, you know, we got a couple thousand people in there. We've got a department of 600 people services, not a single desktop license. Okay, so this is all they get. So you've got to kind of find a little tricks for them. Anybody tried that one yet? Kind of a separate tab? Yeah, okay. Keep them going. Okay, date fields. Here's a classic one that took me six months to realize. Or, uh, yeah, it was six months on this one. Um, is your offset functions. So this is actually a snapshot of our Tableau server. So I set up a six-month data set. And when I ran it, uh, I ran it in January 2014. That's when I published it. Okay, it's on auto refresh every month. Perfect, nothing to worry about. Six months later, damn, my dashboard's broken. I don't get it. You know, it's like I'm looking at it. Right, it's updated, and <clears throat> I'm looking at it in desktop. Totally makes sense. All my data's there. But what happens in server is if you publish something in January 2014, for example, and it's a six-month refresh, and now you're up in September, it's not smart enough to just go to the current month unless you specifically tell it that in its filters or things like that. Okay. So this is where using kind of a month offset concept or um, you know previous month, current month. Just um, is make sure that those are potentially enabled in your dashboards because it will save you headaches of people opening up and going, I don't have any data in my dashboard. Because most people are used to opening up and it's right there, right? Um, so just a, a, a quick little thing. Maybe I'm just kind of saying it how um, <laughs> scarily um, technically inept our customer services department is. <laughs> um, but um, they're, I mean, they're all great folks, super sharp, but you know, these are just things they're missing. Okay. So, um, Use, yeah, use that month offset. Beware when you publish that when it does run out of data, it will do this to you. All right, what else do I got here? 
Um, using custom colors with caution. Um, does everybody know how to put in a custom color palette? Okay. So I'm not going to go too much into this. If, if people want to kind of learn how to do it, it's a great trick. Execs love it. Okay. But there's a, be careful. I guess that's my only point here on this one. Okay. So I'm going to show up a beta version of a dashboard we have. And this is our customer, custom color palette. And, um, you know, it looks like somebody went to the neon rave and kind of threw up all over this map to me, right? And it's, what's funny is, is that the data behind this and the work that was put into it is awesome. And the guy who did it is super sharp. And we're just got a couple refinements away from making it, making it great. And what's, what I think is even funnier is when this one got released, every exec in our um, office was all over it. It was getting forwarded all over the company just because it used all these corporate colors, right? But a couple things, you know. Um, so, for example, um, the phone here, right? Um, um, you can see my mouse. Purple, okay? What does this, what does phones have to do with the purple up here? Nothing, right? Great idea to have that background purple, but if you're not highlighting phones somehow in your visualization, what's the point, right? Another thing, our corporate, you know, our palette, like most people, you know, let's say five to ten colors, that's all you got. So if you've got a dimension, so here we've got states and regions and LMAs, it's a lot more than five to ten of those, right? So all of a sudden your, your colors are repeating, and there's just no rhyme or reason to it, okay? So um, just a good thing to notice, like make sure you're applying those custom colors appropriately, because they can be really powerful, but um, don't get caught up in it, because I guess that's kind of the, the lesson there. All right, so do I got anything uh, uh, else here? No, that's back to the beginning. So um, I'm gonna jump back into PowerPoint. I'm going to steal a look at my watch. So we've got, uh, we're about 45 minutes in. Um, so I'm just going to kind of fly through a couple of these things. Are we back? Okay, great. Okay, so a couple of Tableau server settings that, um, and I'm not here to talk about Tableau server at all. Um, I'm an admin. Um, I've got all the rights, but I'm certainly not on the back end installing everything. Okay, so, but we use MS Exchange. Um, I'm assuming most people do that, but for our customer services group, you know, when you've got five, 600 people, there's no way you can create custom groups and manage it. It's just, especially if you've got one person doing it, okay? So what we try to do is put the work back on the department. So what we just, we, what, before we publish any dashboard, we ask who needs access and is there a current email alias that you can agree on that can have it, right? So one of the kind of the back end hints on that is that, um, you can actually synchronize and set your group permissions based on your exchange email groups, all right? So if you, for example, if we have an email alias that says Seattle SEO um, customer service, and there's 47 people in it, every time somebody gets hired, it gets pulled, you know, um, hired, let go, transfers, you know, the managers are updating that. That's their, that's their baby, right? It's the way they communicate with their team. So it's the best way to do that, right? So you just say, hey, this is an SEO report, Let's use that alias, you're updating it. All I have to do is just keep refreshing it, syncing it, and I've got what you need. And so it goes back on them and they say, so-and-so doesn't have access. And it, it, you know, it's, it's a Pavlov thing, it's rep repetition, right? So you know, you're, you, it's almost like I have an auto email reply. When, when, I, when I see permissions in it, I should just have something that sends back, have you updated your email address, right, your group. Um, and that solves most of it. Now, one of the things that we haven't done yet and that I'm really looking forward to is this is still a manual process for us. So we do it about every week and we just synchronize. It takes three or four minutes and it just kind of brings our whole company back into alignment on Tableau Server. But that's once a week, right? So we'd like to do it every day. And there's actually a batch script I was looking in on the back, um, kind of like in the Total Geek Fest zone on Tableau.com that you can actually run a batch script that'll do that. So um, I would... Um, you know, if you guys want, I can try to forward that, that article to you, but really useful. Um, but if you're not utilizing those, um, the email actual groups, I would recommend it. Try to use that for the permissions on reports. Um, this is so simple, it's obvious. When you set up your Tableau server, just try to have it align with your org, right? So when people are trying to navigate through it, just make it more intuitive for them, okay? Because um, it's inherent that if you start sending out, and this is something I don't do anymore, I don't send direct links to dashboards anymore. I actually send them to the projects, right? It's almost like I'm forcing them to learn how to navigate. Because what happens is they inherently lose that link 
and it comes right back to you. I can't find my dashboard, right? And like, you know, I'm talking 500 emails potentially. Can't find my dashboard, can't find my dashboard, okay? So um, uh, what's the analogy? Teach them how to fish, right? You know, instead of giving them the fish, okay? A um, couple more hints on server. This was, this was one of my favorites. Um, our old and new URL names. Who's got, create, who's got a simple URL, URL Tableau server name here? We got one, a couple, right? Our first one was this mess of, you know, it made sense to our devs, but if you, if you have somebody on the, on the floor that's trying to remember where to log into for Tableau server, they don't know what Tuck is, you know, in our data centers and, and all that. They know what tableau.cobalt.com is though, okay? Real easy change, if you haven't done it, that's the first email I do when you go home and write to your Tableau admin. What's, you know, what's, what's the name of our server? Let's make it simple. Let's make it easy to remember. We actually have a QA and a dev environment as well, and ours are just um, tableau.dev.cobalt.com and .qa. Yeah, pretty easy stuff to remember. Okay. Um, anybody using email alerts? Wow. It's pretty good. Yeah, okay. Uh, make sure you set that up. Send, you know, keep poking, poke, poke, poke that admin you have, right? Email alerts are great. It allows people to kind of schedule their stuff to them. And it's, a, it's, a, it's pretty, pretty powerful. And I found it the most powerful on reports that are quarterly. So let's say you're just something refreshing every quarter. They're bound to lose and forget where it is, right? You've got three months of other distractions. When I finally get somebody want to look at it, yeah, they don't remember it. But if, you, if they set it up where it gets emailed um, on you know, September 1st, January 1st, whatever it may be, bang, it's right in your box and you're reviewing it. Um, oh, and finally, data collector. I'm embarrassed to say, uh, I'm not even gonna ask the question because we're not using it right now, but you can set up data collector on the back end and actually monitor who's logging into your reports, what they're doing, how long they're on it, what's the most popular. You can go in and kind of hack it with your normal t Tableau server admin, so we, we look at it that way. But there's actually a full data source that records everything that your server's doing, and you can just dive very deep into that. Is, any, is anybody doing that? I mean, a couple people nodding their heads. Um, we're just about to launch it. We're in the process of um, upgrading 8.2, and so that'll get fired up for us here. Um, okay, um, a little, little long here, I apologize. But um, training, you know, that was one of the things, like how do you train 500 people? Um, just a couple hints that we've done is, um, when the groups were smaller when I first started off, I was doing it myself. You know, 30, 40 people, not a problem. Let's walk through the dashboard, okay? But when we started to roll out to um, kind of the larger subset of our audience, there's two, 300 people there, right? So I realized that that's just not sustainable. So we kind of came up with a train the trainer concept. And what I was talking about earlier, those subject matter experts, those people that are really involved in data, that's why you really want to recruit them because they're your go-to people for everyone out there. So what you want is you want a buffer between yourself and, and the floor, okay? And by forcing, and this is just kind of something I learned through some headaches, but by forcing those subject matter, those SMEs, to actually do the training. Maybe you're just sitting in, on, you know, in the back corner with a little smirk on your face and, you know, and, and hoping nobody recognizes you. But by forcing them to do the training, when, when people have questions, they're going to go straight to the trainer. Okay? So just a um, real quick, quick hint that if you get the chance, like, really try to empower your organization. And plus, it makes these people feel really good. I mean, it really does. Um, it just, it's just an added sense of responsibility and they know their managers are watching, and it's just, you know, they're motivated. So good stuff. Um, oh, and then um, this is something that um, I always forgot to do, and, um, you know, I'm just going to tell you, it's easy to tell somebody to do it, but I didn't even do it myself. We've got an internal training organization, right? I can kick myself for not sitting them down for a few hours when I was doing this and saying, this is how you use Tableau, this is why it's important in our organization, and this is why every new hire you bring in Tableau should be in that presentation, right? So everybody that comes in to, that com to the company, regardless of the role, Tableau, na that name should be dropped. If you're using it in there, get your, get your HR folks on it. Get those sales training folks. Like, I don't know if you guys all have customer services groups, but obviously you've got to have like a training staff for that. So you're going to get a lot better bang from your buck if you work with them initially. And that's just one of those, you know, hindsight's 20-20. Um, I could kick myself for that. So um, we're in the process of doing that right now. So I just kind of wanted to share that little, little trick as well. Um, and a couple other things. So in the training um, for launches, I actually started to spend more time 
highlighting the Tableau server navigation than I actually did on the dashboards. Because if you, if you design a good dashboard, it should make sense, right? If you did all my great tips and tricks, people should just be able to open it and, and start dancing, right? But Tableau doesn't, you know, server environment doesn't have all its tips and tricks, you know? You got these little icons right here. These probably all look familiar to us. They mean nothing to normal people, nothing. They're so small, people don't even click on them. And I think I saw in the new version, they were hiding them at the bottom to boot. Uh, I think it gave you the opportunity in 9 in the demo. I think you could change it. But you know, it's probably going to default on the bottom. So then people are really not going to know where to look. All right? So spend some time talking about that. Um, spend some time, you know, your, your PDF. You include, exclude you know, on that. Nobody, nobody does that. You know how great that is to modify your visuals and um, server? It's good stuff. And then here's, here's kind of my last little point here. It's just launch order. So like I said, we were um, serving a customer services org. And um, we've got managers, and we've got the floor. Okay? So our first um, dashboards were actually, we, we built about six or seven of them. And then we were going to launch them all at once. And a few of them were for managers, and a few of them were for the floor. And people were starting to get excited. They were going to get access to all this data. And I started to get this vibe from some people that they were actually a little bit nervous about this Tableau product, that it was Big Brother, right? That it wasn't there to help them, it was there to monitor them. It was for the managers, right? And if you, as you're launching things or as you can spin things on, the, on these things, keep that in mind that if you've got a large customer services department, you want them embracing this stuff, right? You don't want them kind of looking over their shoulder and, you know, Big Brother Tableau is going to bust me because I'm not, you know, I'm only 80% of the way through my accounts or whatever it may be. So what we decided to do or the first things we launched were actually all the tools that were for the customer services for. And so there was, we, and it was kind of fun telling the managers just to, you know, give me the old stop sign. And uh, I think in hindsight, it was the, the right thing to do. So we've got a lot better adoption because of that. Um, oh, and then just to give you a, like a quick summary of where we, where kind of we think we're going as a company. So I've been talking about dashboards designed by analysts, right, for internal use. So that's what we, I basically just, hopefully didn't waste your time on the last, you know, last 45 minutes. But that's what, we, that's what we've been doing, okay? So the goal is to move in to dashboards, you know, designed by analysts, but for external use, right? We're in the process of doing that right now. Poking holes in our firewall, letting GM actually get in into our Tableau server and share that stuff, okay? But the final trick, and there's a lot of symposiums on that at the conference, is the self-service data solution. Okay? That's our, still our pie in the guy's you know, goal. How great would it be if somebody could go into, you know, we've got petabytes of data, basically. How great would it be if a customer services rep could go in there and start playing around, right? instead of having to pre-formulate pre everything? So we're trying to figure out ways to do that. We're not there yet. But maybe if you guys come to the next conference the next year or two, you know, some schmuck will be up there like me, and they'll be talking about how we solved, you know, solved the world, all right? Solve the world's problems. So a quick kind of takeaways, you know, utilize your resources. If you guys don't have SMEs and testers, you know, empower that group. They'll, they'll feel real good about themselves. Um, dashboard design, you know, design to the lowest common denominator. You know, make it simple. Um, make it easy enough for Dilbert's boss. You know, um, I just put that in last minute. Um, if you're not using Exchange email aliases, it's not a bad trick. Uh, maybe talk to your admin on that. Um, it certainly makes um, managing all those groups a little bit easier for us because um, it kind of puts the onus on the actual services groups. Finally, training. You know, train the trainer. Use those SMEs. And just don't forget the basics. Okay? Um, that's it. I went over. I'm sorry. Um, you guys seemed interested, so that was good. Um, any questions? Uh, no, was that good? Uh, no? um, anyway, I'm just uh, I'm excited you guys came. I hope this was helpful, and um, I hope you really enjoy the rest of the conference.